Today is a special occasion. A year ago from the upload date of this video marks the day that Cygnus Destroyer's retro reviews went live. Wow. It's been a year already? It feels like just yesterday. As longtime viewers know, it all started with Bucky O'Hare, a Konami NES release based on one of my favorite cartoons. So, what better way to celebrate than by covering a slew of Konami titles based on another beloved childhood franchise? This isn't fitting the tone. I need something a little less spacey and more zany. Hmm. Ah, I know! Perfect! With that settled, we're gonna push the Looney Switch to overdrive with six Tiny Toon Adventures games! Well, more like five and a half, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Cue the prerequisite background information section! Tiny Toon Adventures aired from 1990 to 1995 in syndication and on Saturday mornings. It was conceived as a younger, hipper, updated version of Looney Tunes. In fact, the elder statesmen from that property, including the ever-famous Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck, had roles as the teachers of their next-generation counterparts, such as Buster and Babs Bunny and Plucky Duck, on the Acme University campus in Acme Acres. Unlike Bucky O'Hare, Tiny Toon Adventures was uber huge when I was a kid, and while Bucky still had a home console iteration despite its brief airtime, Tiny Toons had a bajillion in one for both 8 and 16-bit systems and handouts, so we'll jump right in without any further delay. I'm going to stick with my Power Rangers system and gradually build up in quality with the highlights saved for last. Now, prepare thyself for the epic grandeur that is... Tiny Toon Adventures Cartoon Workshop. Yay! Remember how I said this would encompass five and a half Tiny Toon titles? This is the half I was referring to. Cartoon Workshop really isn't a game at all. Belonging in the same class of NES peers, Videomation, Color a Dinosaur, or even Taboo the Sixth Sense. The most appropriate way to categorize it would be as a drawing slash animation tool set slash program, but a very basic one. The would-be artist has to create a scene with a variety of elements, choosing the actors or props, settings, soundtrack, and dialogue. Locations range from Acme University, to the desert or a creepy castle, to simple plain monochromatic backdrops. The majority of the primary gang is available in a multitude of poses to liven up the action of the movies. Want Plucky to crash into the front steps of the school while Buster looks on munching on a carrot? Done! Ever wanted to see Little Beeper swat the moon with a tennis racket while Furball skates mid-air while saying, Ah, nothing like a nice relaxing dip in the old duck pond? Easy as pie in Cartoon Workshop. While this game isn't as limitless as the human imagination, there's still a number of eccentric short films that can be strung together with what is available. Dare I say that I actually had fun while capturing footage, something I wouldn't have believed from this type of quasi-educational, kid-friendly entertainment. This doesn't mean that I recommend actively seeking it out, but if it can be found for less than $5, there are definitely worse things to drop a link in on. Released in 1993, way late in the lifespan of the NES, Tiny Toon Adventures 2 Trouble in Wacky Land is far removed from its successful predecessor. A new amusement park has opened in Acme Acres and excitement is high among the residents. Buster receives a letter from a secret admirer inviting him and all his friends to the grand opening. Who is this generous benefactor? None other than Montana Max, duh! 
Trouble in Wacky Land, or as I prefer to call it, Tiny Toon Adventures in the Magic Kingdom, as this late release shares a lot in common with the earlier Capcom benchmark. In Adventures in the Magic Kingdom, the friend of Mickey has to collect six silver keys located on iconic rides, Space Mountain, the Haunted Mansion, etc. to gain access to the castle. In Wacky Land, Buster and crew have to pick up four golden tickets obtained after entrance to the attractions of the park. So, Konami ripped off Capcom's idea. For shame. Whereas Adventures in the Magic Kingdom shifted from first-person on-rail segments to third-person side-scrolling and beyond, Trouble in Wacky Land pretty much sticks to the platforming tradition of its older brother. Babs braves the roller coaster, Furball the log ride, Hampton boards the train, and Plucky bounces back on the bumper car. Instead of lives, the player has 10 tickets to gain admittance to the rides, and the amount required varies, with 4 for the roller coaster, 3 for the logs, 2 for the train, and 1 for the bumper cars. The way the tickets are used determines how many attempts there are per continue, with the higher ticket attractions resulting in fewer wax and vice versa. The difficulty, in spite of unlimited continues, is quite high, and the only event I was able to complete was the bumper cars, itself aggravating at times. Trouble in Wacky Land isn't bad, but it pales next to the superior original NES offering. If you want to play an amusement park simulator, go with the Disney Capcom Trailblazer over this Konami copycat. Again, it's not terrible, but to paraphrase South Park, Capcom did it! They created the concept and they did it best. Magic Kingdom is Dr. Pepper in comparison to Wacky Land's Mr. Pib, a less satisfying knockoff. There were a number of Tiny Toons handhelds, but this is the only one I own, which happens to be the first, outside of the Tiger Electronics LCD unit. The story is simple. Babs wants to pursue her dream of acting, and she decides to hit the road in order to take that extra step. Buster, Plucky, and Hampton decide to tag along and make sure she doesn't get into trouble, which is inevitable because, come on, this is Babs. Trouble's her middle name. In Babs' Big Break, the male Toon Trio are the selectable characters, not the wannabe actress in this portable platformer. Unless you consider the Game Boy player's pink buster sprite to be Babs. The control is loose and slidey, as if they're always moving on ice, and this resulted in a few unnecessary deaths, but the slipperiness doesn't break B times 3. Being that the Game Boy only had two action buttons, it's a surprise to no one that A jumps and B attacks. Attacking, in this case, means fruit flinging. Buster throws carrots, Plucky hurls pineapples, and Hampton lobs watermelons. Fruit is littered around each stage, so ammunition is just around the corner. Though I generally stuck to the Super Mario Stomp to crush my enemies. One thing that is a little annoying about Babs Big Break is that there is the option to play as three different characters, yet each share one life bar. This, along with the limited continues and the lack of a password feature, add extra challenge to this lightweight leaper. Each level requires the assistance of members of the supporting cast, including Dizzy, Shirley the Loon, and Fifi, to progress past roadblocks, and the way they do so is always comical. Dizzy mows down moles and Fifi stink blast trees. There's a boss fight after each obstacle is cleared, one of which being Dizzy Devil himself, who's hungry and needs help filling his belly. Others include Arnold the Pitbull and the final showdown with Montana Max. I will give B to the third power my respect for utilizing the license in an exceptional manner. Elmira's just as much of a pest, Babs equally a cut-up, and even ancillary figures Little Sneezer and Bookworm make an appearance in the bonus rounds. All in all, Triple B is decent as far as handheld hoppers go. It's not so horrible that it's unplayable, 
but it's not a must-own of the Kirby's Dream Land or Super Mario Land caliber. It excels in the use of the Tiny Toons, but as a side-scrolling platformer, it's middle of the road. At this point, I'm going to diverge from the lowest to highest quality scale and talk about these remaining three in no particular order, since it's hard for me to choose my absolute favorite when looking at them objectively without nostalgic bias. Let's begin with... Buster Bust Loose! BBL is yet another side-scrolling platformer, but it contains a few unique traits that both elevate it above its siblings and hold it back from excelling. On the plus side, Bus Loose deviates from the standard Monty's up to no good and or has captured Babs and Buster has to rescue her plot. Instead, it stays closest to the name of the series and involves random adventures at the university to Spook Mansion, all the way to the Space Opera Finale. Speaking of unique, this 16-bit gem is the only Tiny Toons title of the ones I own that has the ability to change the difficulty level, with children being the easiest and challenge being the toughest. I only briefly experimented with the children setting, as my main playthrough was done on normal. Unlike its Babs-fronted portable ancestor, the titular character is the one and only controllable star of this show, and that's not a drawback in any way. Overall, Buster's movement is very fluid and responsive. His main foe extermination trick is the aerial dropkick, executed with a press of the X or Y button. This doubly functions as a method of gaining extra momentum and landing arduous jumps. The second especially notable factor is Buster's Dash Speed Boost, accomplished by pressing L or R. Mastering this skill is mandatory to reach the later portion of the quest, and this is much easier said than done. Stage 2 separates the men from the boys, with the hair pulling chore of performing the dash at the perfect time in conjunction with jumping at the right moment, while also picking up the go-go icons that refilled the dash meter. I lost count of the number of times that I died from losing dash juice and being crushed by the screen. You have to get all of the go-go's or death time and again is inevitable. Furthermore on the hair pulling front, the fourth level is my least favorite aspect of all of these tiny toony titles. Yes, even Cartoon Workshop. The damn football level! This is a blemish on a near masterpiece and is out of place. In theory, it should be a piece of cake. The sole goal is to score one touchdown to win the match for Acme University. That's it. The problem is that there's no set pattern for the rival defenders. You can jump high, you'll get stopped in your tracks. Stay low, sacked city. First downs ease the burden and keep the home team alive but if too many tackles occur with no downs in the interim, the player will lose a life. Maybe I'm making mountains out of molehills, but I'm sorry. This is just dumb. I respect Konami for enlivening the static side-scrolling stages with a fresh dynamic, but this should have been relegated to the sports tie-in. Nevertheless, hiccups notwithstanding, Buster Bust Loose is still phenomenal in almost every way. The music is memorable, the bonus stages with the wheel are a nice diversion. What's not to love? With the aforementioned exceptions and the broken password system that only brings up the children versions of the levels, requiring beating it in one sitting on normal up, or else getting the incomplete ending aside, Buster indeed busts loose, and in grand style! You can't go wrong with this... <clears throat> Copyright Rue. Does the axiom hold true? Genesis does what Nintendo don't? Yes and no. Buster's Hidden Treasure is another solo trek since the bunny's friends have been kidnapped by Monty and the initial boss fights involve the brainwashed buddies reminiscent of Bucky O'Hare. 
The leftover cast of Concord, Sneezer, and Little Beeper play a support role similar to Genesis X-Men, helping Buster with an enemy genocide accomplished with 50 collected carrots and a press of the A button. On initial glance, hidden treasure may appear to share a lot in common with its SNES counterpart, but a hands-on analysis will reveal a number of differences between the two. Instead of a dash, Buster can slide by pressing B at the velocity of a full-on sprint. The dropkick is gone, replaced with the typical head stomps of yore. Buster here can bounce off walls a la Batman or Ryu Hayabusa. This could just be my Sega bias talking, but Buster seems faster in Hidden Treasure than Bust Loose. Blast processing, perhaps? Buster Bust Loose begins with 3 hit points, 3 lives, and 5 continues, whereas Hidden Treasure also has a 3 heart life bar, but it is expandable up to 5 with bell power-ups, and in further contrast, has unlimited continues. Normally, this would make completion a stroll in the park, but this is not the case with Hidden Treasure. Treasure has an abundance of every Retro Nuts nightmare. Water segments. Picture the most difficult Mario swimming section, and double the danger. That will give an accurate measurement of Hidden Treasure's take on this vehemently hated design. Hidden Treasure's layout takes after the Italian Plumber's classics, with a number of sub-areas leading to the main boss fight at the end of a world. All of the greatest hits from Mario and other side-scrollers are included in Treasure. Woods? Check. Fire? Of course. Ice? Would it be a proper platformer if it didn't include this tried-and-true cliché? Readdressing the topic of difficulty, Treasure is actually fairly easy until the last level. Monty's Stronghold is about on par with any Mega Man Dr. Wily's castle, with turkey jumps and mazes aplenty. This feat will necessitate Herculean hardcore skills, as the mean millionaire himself, and all of the parts that precede the fight, have to be done on one continue, or else start from the beginning. I sadly wasn't up to the challenge. But, with enough patience and perseverance, I'm sure it is possible to complete. Buster's Hidden Treasure is an excellent Genesis deep cut, and utilizes the franchise to near perfection. The music is FM synthesis tasty, the sprites are colorful and vibrant, and the utilization of the B-Brigade as enemy clearing weapons is a nice touch. Genesis or Mega Drive owners should definitely seek this out. Closing out this Mega Review is the one that has the most nostalgic value for me, the original NES Tiny Toons. Another in the American Gladiators and Rescue the Embassy mission category of carts that were owned by my cousins, so I played this quite a bit as a wee lad. This NES classic shares the most in common with Bab's Big Break. Buster is again the primary protagonist, but Furball, Plucky, and Dizzy Devil are selectable as secondary sidekicks, each having individual skills, such as Dizzy's Spin and Furball's Claws, which Shirley the Loon provides guidance in choosing. The control scheme is the NES standard, familiar to us as much as our left hand. So there's no point in an in-depth analysis. Holding B makes Buster run, and pressing it activates Furball, Dizzy, and Plucky special moves. Very basic stuff. The objective of the quartet is to rescue Babs from the dastardly Montana Max, who surprises Buster about the news via TV, a la Warlock from Monster in My Pocket. <coughs> Watch my review. <coughs> <coughs> Seriously, <coughs> it's really good. <coughs> Whoa, <coughs> must have got a tickle in my throat. Anyway, it's been said that this is one of the many Super Mario Bros. 3 clones, and there is validity to that statement. It's blatantly obvious that Konami was influenced by Miyamoto, and they wear it on their sleeves. In film and music terms, this comes off as an homage, where Trouble in Wacky Land was a note-for-note -note cover of Adventures in the Magic Kingdom. As with most of the previously discussed entries, Fearsome Fiend of Furry Creatures Big and Small, Elmira, features prominently as a mini-boss. 
true to the show, Elmira wants to hug and kiss all the little animals. The only penalty an Elmira crush will cause is a level reset. Still, it's best to avoid her, since she can't be killed, and make a break for the exit. Konami's faithfulness in translation of licensed properties such as this really makes me wish they had a stronger hold on the ocean-cornered market. As much as I love the original Tiny Toons, I'm not so biased that I can't admit that it has flaws. Though it's minor, the secondary characters aren't selectable at will. Instead, Buster has to pop a balloon and obtain a tune around to enable the switcheroo. Once Dizzy and company are available, Buster is placed in the reserve spot until another tune around is picked up. Again, this is a small nitpick, but it still diminishes some of the enjoyment factor. Contributing immensely to the positive vibes is the superb soundtrack. While the theme song is the constant anchor and template for the majority of the pieces throughout, the original compositions are truly stellar, especially Gene Splicer's Lair and the soothing score to 2-2. So dreamy and peaceful. This could lull me into a gentle sleep. Earlier I claimed that the finale of Buster's Hidden Treasure was brutal? That is true, but it's Barbie supermodel in comparison to this tough SOB. By default, unless one of the extra heart points is picked up, one hit equals death. Factor in that there's minimal learning curve, and things get rough by the second world, even two hit points is not enough for all but the more advanced players. This also suffers from the Mario-ification of having to beat an entire area in one continue, or go back to the start. Fortunately, there are again unlimited continues, and carrots can be traded into Hampton for extra lives. So, the player with a lot of spare time, which was not me for this review, can trial and error their way through this rescue mission. The Contra Scale Struggle is balanced out by a killer soundtrack, tight control mechanics, and just overall awesomeness. Buster Bust Loose, Buster's Hidden Treasure, and NES Tiny Toons all get my highly recommended seal of approval, but if I had to choose just one, I'd have to give my preference to the original. Call me biased or accuse me of wearing rose-colored glasses, but even with the multiplied frustration factor, it's still the most fun of all of them. Either way, a tiny, toony, loony time is assured no matter which you pick up. That concludes my one-year anniversary special. It's been quite a ride. Uh, it's been the most fun I've ever had in my life. Uh, deciding to create this channel and start doing the reviews, best decision I've ever had. Uh, I'll spare the details, but before I decided to do that, I was in a pretty low place. I wasn't depressed, but I was kind of close and had mood swings all over the place. But ever since I started making these videos, it's just been all up and roses and everything's great. So... I have no intention to stop anytime soon. The second year will be just as good and maybe even better than the first year. I've actually got a second spin-off show planned in the works, which will probably, I think I'm going to start debuting that in December. It'll be a lot easier to make than these, which is the good thing, so making this show, which I'm not going to say what it is, but I'll give you a little hint, it kind of involves kind of involves. It directly involves a company on one of the posters behind me, hint hint, but I'm going to talk about them in a different light than most people talk about this company in. So look forward to that in December. Uh, I just want to thank everybody, all the subscribers, all the viewers. Even if you've just watched one of my videos and didn't like it, I thank you anyway for just giving me the time. I want to extend thanks to RetroWare and Gamester81 for their support in featuring my videos. It's greatly appreciated. And it's a true honor to be featured on the front pages of your website. You, you all inspired me so greatly, so it's just, like I said, true honor. So, here's to year number two being even better than number one. 
I'll talk to you all later.